Anti-aircraft guns went into action against unidentified aircraft in the Los Angeles area. Shortly after 3 a.m. Pacific War Time this morning. The anti-aircraft guns began barking during a blackout ordered by the 4th Interceptor Command at 2.25 a.m. The unidentified object, which some sources thought might be a blimp, moved slowly down the Pacific coast from Santa Monica and disappeared south of Long Beach. Army officials declined to comment on the possibility that the object might have been a blimp. However, it required nearly 30 minutes to travel some 25 miles, far slower than an airplane. Thus recites the February 25, 1942 radio commentary of the famous CBS reporter Byron Palmer of the event that happened the night before and became famous with the name of the Battle of Los Angeles. The Battle of Los Angeles. This was the name given by contemporary news agencies to the sighting of one or more unidentified flying objects which occurred between the night of February the 24th and the dawn of February the 25th, 1942. The reports of numerous eyewitnesses seem to confirm the presence of one or more unknown objects in the sky above Los Angeles during that night, more than 80 years ago. The alarm triggered a massive intervention by the US Army, which, after sounding the air raid alarm and triggering a blackout affecting the whole area around the city, fired more than 1,440 artillery rounds into the sky. However, Despite this massive firepower, no aircraft was shot down. The halo of mystery surrounding the whole story and, above all, on the nature of the flying object is still a source of debate today. Therefore, we will try to understand what actually happened that night and who or what flew over the skies of Los Angeles during the night of February the 24th, 1942. After the terrible Japanese attack on the base of Pearl Harbor, a strong concern developed throughout the United States regarding a possible second Japanese attack against the US West Coast, particularly in Los Angeles. The entire Pacific coast had been heavily militarized with the installation of anti-aircraft positions and the execution of periodic mainly nighttime exercises, the darkening of cities at night in order to make any targets of attacks less visible, and the involvement of civilians in the civil defense program with the dissemination of a series of safety rules that the population would have followed in the event of an enemy attack.
It is precisely in this climate of terror and neurosis that, in February 1942, on the night between the 24th and the 25th, in the early hours of the morning, from the horizon line between the night sky and the Pacific Ocean, an enormous object of unknown origin appears, with protective detection devices active. The object continues its trajectory eastward towards the city of Los Angeles, at a very high speed, skimming over the water. 120 miles away from the City of Angels, the object detects the electronic probes of the Army's long-range listening apparatus and withdraws its protection shields, reducing speed and veering suddenly towards Point Dune, about 50 miles away from downtown Los Angeles. report that the object completely disappeared from the radar as it skirted the north side of the Santa Monica Mountains in an easterly direction. It then veered south, into the crevice in the mountains around Sepulveda Boulevard and Mulholland Drive, coming behind the targeting direction of most of the anti-aircraft guns and every conceivable army radar or long-range listening device. Continuing its steep ascent of the Santa Monica Mountains, the object curved slightly to the east, well above the 511-foot elevation of Baldwin Hills, in what appeared to be, for all intents and purposes, an effort to stay away from all potential aircraft and associated armaments at Los Angeles Minesfield Airport, today's LAX. The object then veered west towards the ocean, flying over aircraft manufacturing facilities near the El Segundo tank farm, finally descending and heading south along the coast. A carpenter in civilian life, who enlisted in the US Navy together with his partner Tom Shaw after the attack on Pearl Harbor. After leaving the Navy, he became a builder of Ford flathead motorboats with wooden hulls. The Navy sent him to Point Wenema and Point Magoo, near Ventura, California, to help with the early stages of construction of the naval facilities that were being built there. Bar is William Bill Stout. During this time, he met and began dating a young woman who lived in a rather isolated section of the mountains east of Wenema, not far from Paramount Ranch. an old western movie set used on and off over the years by various movie studios. Late one evening, after meeting the woman, he was returning to base to make sure he didn't miss the morning muster when, on a small road that climbed towards the city of Algura, his car had a flat tire. The man had borrowed the vehicle from a Navy colleague and didn't know how to change the punctured tyre on that specific model of car. Also, he was on a dark road, at night, with no flashlight. In short, it took much longer and much more effort than expected to change the wheel. After changing the tyre, despite the cold, the late hour, his tiredness and the dirt, he sat by the roadside, lit a cigarette and leaned against the tall weeds to rest his back for a few minutes. As he did so, a gigantic object, a huge mass flying not much higher than the treetops, making no sound but obscuring much of the night sky and the stars, passed slowly overhead, curving east after emerging from the southwest.
When he returned to base, the place was in an uproar. People were running everywhere, forming platoons, climbing into trucks with rifles and grenades, and wearing gas masks. They told him that the city of Los Angeles was under air attack, and that there was a statewide blackout, and that they needed to move along the coast as soon as possible to protect the city and country from enemy invasion. A few trucks left, but most didn't, and by dawn, everything had calmed down. Clamoringly, they were told it had been a simple misunderstanding and that they should put their weapons away and return to their normal activities. Shortly afterwards, Bill Stout was sent to the South Pacific. He didn't tell anyone about what happened and, with the end of the war and the passage of time, he forgot almost everything about it. Until, one day in the late 1980s, he saw a film called 1941 by Steven Spielberg on television. Although essentially a comedy, in the film the California coast was attacked by a Japanese submarine and the resulting outcome, except for the giant airborne object, was very similar to what he began to remember about his experience of February 1942. Thus, for the first time, he began to tell friends about the incident he had experienced. But none of them knew what he was talking about, and some even believed that he had suddenly gone insane. Yet the man continued to talk about that night, adding more and more details to his story. He said he thought at first that it could have been an airship, because, due to the darkness that night when he pulled over, he left the car's headlights on in order to have as much light as possible to change the punctured tyre. Therefore, he immediately assumed that the object could have been an enemy airship and that it had purposely flown over his position because the car's headlights, dim as they were, were the only visible light source for miles and miles. But the airship theory soon crumbled in William's mind when he realized the real size of the object. Able to fly over his head for many seconds and covering a large part of the night sky. Not only that, the sight of that flying object reminded him in a disturbing way of another incident that had occurred a few months earlier. He was carrying out training for the Navy using an inflatable life raft when, suddenly, the boat was overwhelmed by a huge wave and it capsized. He was trapped under the water as the force of the waves drove him against the rocks. Until, kicking out, he managed to emerge from under the life raft and swam to the beach. When, on the night of February the 24th, William saw the giant object flying overhead, the man said he felt the same apprehension and fear that he had felt when he was trapped in the water under the life raft, as if he were about to suffocate or drown. Now, let's return to that fateful night between February the 24th and 25th, 1942. 
As the unidentified object continued its approach towards the Los Angeles city area and then disappeared behind mountains inland along the western coast, the regional controller of the air raid warning system, still nervous about the Japanese attack on the Elwood offshore oil wells near Santa Barbara, California, therefore in the same area where the sighting took place and only a few hours earlier, ordered the anti-aircraft batteries to go into green alert, that is, ready to fire. At 2.15 in the morning, with the object's location still unknown, for the first time since the beginning of the war, the controller ordered the entire alarm system to be activated, with a blackout affecting the whole region, from Los Angeles to the Mexican border, and up into the San Joaquin Valley. However, despite these measures, and despite everything that happened in the following hours, People still wonder today why US planes weren't ordered to stop the object during its approach. Paul T. Collins, in an article written for Fate magazine and published in July 1987 under the title World War II UFO Scare, states After the Elwood incident had alerted all the West Coast defense posts to possible repeat attacks, these units were sensitive to anticipated invasion attempts. By Wednesday morning, in the Los Angeles area, they were ready to open fire on a boy's kite if it in any way resembled a plane or balloon. Secretary of War Henry Stimson commended the 37th Artillery Division for this attitude. It is better to be a little too alert than not alert enough, he said. At the same time, he delicately suggested that it might have been a good idea to send some of our planes up to identify the invading aircraft before shooting at them. Planes of the 4th Interceptor Command were, in fact, warming up on the runways waiting for orders to go up and interview the unknown intruders. Why, everybody was asking, were they not ordered to go into action during the 51-minute period between the first air raid alert at 2.25 a.m. and the first artillery firing at 3.16? In 1983, the US government printing office published a multi-volume set entitled The Army Air Forces in World War II, edited by Wesley Frank Craven and James Leah Kate. In Volume 1, Chapter 3, there is what is nothing short of an official confirmation of the scenario described so far, at least regarding the unknown nature of the flying object. Radars picked up an unidentified target 120 miles west of Los Angeles. Anti-aircraft batteries were alerted at 2.15 and were put on green alert, ready to fire a few minutes later. The AAF kept its pursuit planes on the ground, preferring to await indications of the scale and direction of any attack 
before committing its limited fighter force. Radars tracked the approaching target to within a few miles of the coast and at 2.21 the regional controller ordered a blackout. Thereafter, the information centre was flooded with reports of enemy planes, even though the mysterious object, tracked in from the sea, seems to have vanished. The site that would have first picked up the object belonged to one of the secret radar sites hidden in the cliffs and hills of the California coast for the protection of Los Angeles. Given the secretive nature of these sites, its exact location is not known. However, it is assumed that the site was along a cliffside lookout between Point Sal and Point Purisima, within a radius of 25 kilometers between the towns of Santa Maria and Lompoc. The site possessed an SCR-268 radar system with a clean, unobstructed scan out into the open Pacific. At 3.06 in the morning, 41 minutes after the radar sighting of the mysterious flying object, four anti-aircraft batteries in the Santa Monica area began firing into the air over the city of Los Angeles and Baldwin Hills. Suddenly, the sky above Los Angeles exploded like a volcano. For the next three hours, there was nothing but confusion and delirium. However, whatever the flying object was, it did not react to the fire of the US Army and, above all, despite the fact that about 1,440 shells of anti-aircraft ammunition had been fired, it did not seem to suffer any damage, managing to disappear completely. As ground batteries continued to wreak havoc on the night sky and huge searchlights illuminated the object, Residents along the 40 miles of coastline running north of Malibu to south of Palos Verdes had a front seat view of the entire action. One such resident, who has since done intensive academic research into the mythological dimensions of the UFO phenomenon, was then a young boy, later to become an honored professor of anthropology at Occidental College, Professor Scott Littleton who lived along the coast in the small oceanfront community of Hermosa Beach in Southern California. In a recollection of the events that occurred that night, he writes, I was an eyewitness to the events of that unforgettable February morning, February the 25th, 1942. I was eight years old at the time and my parents lived at 2500 Strand in Hermosa Beach, right on the beach. We therefore had a grandstand seat. While my father went about his air raid warden duties, my late mother and I watched the glowing object, which was caught in the glare of searchlights from Palos Verdes and surrounded by the puffs of ineffectual anti-aircraft fire as it slowly flew across the ocean from northwest to southeast. It headed inland over Redondo Beach, a couple of miles to the south of our vantage point, and eventually disappeared over the eastern end of the Palos Verdes Hills, 
what today is called Rancho Palos Verdes. The whole incident lasted, at least from our perspective, about half an hour, although we didn't time it. Like other kids in the neighborhood, I spent the next morning picking up pieces of shrapnel on the beach. Indeed, it's a wonder more people weren't injured. In any case, I don't recall seeing any truly discernible configuration, just a small, glowing, slightly oval-shaped blob of light. A single blob. We only saw one object, not several, as some witnesses later reported. At the time, we were convinced it was a Jap reconnaissance plane and that LA might be due for a major air raid in the near future. Remember, this was less than three months after Pearl Harbor. Later, after the war ended, we all expected the government or the military to tell us what was really up there that night. But that never happened. Another eyewitness to the story, a well-known blogger, expert in ufology, whose nickname is The Wanderling, thus recalls the incident, confirming Littleton's account. My father got up that night, when the sirens went off, quickly donning all his anti-aircraft sentry gear and ran out, while my mother and I followed close behind. In a very short time, everyone on the block was out to see what was going on. When the object, or whatever it was, came above us, it wasn't very high above the ground. It was a huge, gigantic thing that loomed over the hills, so big that when it passed over our heads, we couldn't see the sides, only the underside, and it took forever for it to pass over us. When it passed over our house, because it was so low, my father thought it was going to land. In those days, a few miles southeast of us was the Lomita airstrip, along with the remains of a dry lake, and my father assumed it was headed there. So, my father and some neighbors, some of them armed with handguns and shotguns, got into a couple of cars and set down old Sepulveda Boulevard in its pursuit. The object continued south-southeast, gaining speed and altitude. Eventually, the object exited Long Beach and headed south along the California coast towards Huntington Beach, disappearing from our eyes altogether. Where it went, nobody knows. Or maybe they do. Although the object had flown over the heads of hundreds of witnesses that night, 
hardly anyone could discern its actual shape. Some compared it to a Zeppelin-type airship, while others said it was a much, much larger object. Littleton, together with Frank Warren, a highly competent collaborator in the field of UFOs and editor of the UFO Chronicles magazine, using a form of triangulation, calculated an estimate of the real size of the object. Using this black and white image as a starting point, they concluded that given the width of the light beams where they reached the object, considering one of them came from a battery of lighthouses in Manhattan Beach, about 10 kilometers away from the other batteries, the object must have been about 800 feet long. Much larger than a Zeppelin airship. The blogger The Wanderling, on the other hand, seems to remember the shape and details of the object very well, describing it as not round or circular like a zeppelin or other type of airship, but wide and flat and slightly curved towards the centre and concave at the bottom with respect to its outer edges. Furthermore, it bore no signs, hieroglyphic writing, insignia or numbers, terrestrial or otherwise. There were no openings, windows, portholes, hatches, seams or lights. It had no propellers, nor outboard motors and made no sound. It didn't even have wheels, wings, fins or stabilizers, although, as the blogger reports, it was able to climb and descend in altitude, pick up and gain speed immediately, and go so slow that it barely moved. After all, it took more than 30 minutes to travel the approximately 20 miles from Baldwin Hills to the ocean to Redondo Beach. In fact, when the Wanderling's father, along with his neighbors, tried to follow the object, it accelerated to a rather high speed, so much so that their cars could not keep up with it. Then, when it first turned over the ocean, crossing Santa Monica Beach to Redondo, it also flew over the Happy Hour Cafe. Fifi Malouf, an attractive lady who owned the apartments around the cafe, well known and esteemed by most of the men who lived around the area, was interviewed a few days later by the local newspapers. This is how Fifi remembers the object. That night, a huge, giant object, as big as a locomotive, came in off the ocean and flew right over the top of the Happy Hour Cafe and the apartments. I'd heard a ruckus going on outside, sirens, guns firing, all kinds of stuff, so I went out and saw this thing a few hundred feet above the beach slowly glide overhead off the ocean. 
not making a sound, and, because of its length, taking forever to pass over. As far as the rear of the aircraft is concerned, it does not emerge from the witness accounts that it had any exhaust or thrust openings similar to those of a rocket. Some, such as the Wanderling's father, said that while trying to follow it, he was able to notice what looked like three, perhaps four, narrow orange-red openings, like the gills of a shark, only they glowed. It is not even known what the driving force of the object was. Although its size was compared to that of a Zeppelin, it didn't behave like one. Zeppelins are lighter than air machines, and when you look at one, it seems that it is floating in the air rather than flying. Instead, the aircraft in question looked more like a warship and was perceived to be much heavier than an airship. Not only that, but the object made no sound. This is undoubtedly a strange and fascinating element of the whole story, because almost all the vehicles we see moving, and which are of a certain size, locomotives, planes, ships, make a lot of noise. Furthermore, another thing that stood out about the object, again according to the Wanderling, was that it left behind a very slight but distinct smell. If any of you have ever owned an electric train, say a Lionel, you will have noticed the smell that the transformer gives off over a long period of use. Well, after the huge flying object passed over my head, the air smelled very similar to the one I described. Furthermore, for me, what I remember most, even today, is the sadness of that object. It was like a lost baby elephant searching for its mother, and wherever it went, it was chased away or shot. So far, we have described the facts and collected the most important and detailed testimonies of the whole affair. Yet, it doesn't end here. We will now present the witness testimony of another spectator of the events of that night, an exceptional spectator, Albert Nozaki. Oscar-nominated art director, who was responsible for the memorable design of the alien spacecraft in the 1953 film, War of the Worlds. Born in Japan, Nozaki moved to the United States when he was about three years old, with his family, who settled down in Los Angeles. Nozaki earned a bachelor's degree in architecture from the University of Southern California in 1933, and a master's degree in architectural engineering from the University of Illinois in 1934. At the time, the only really hiring industry in the area that guaranteed a certain salary and job security was the film industry. Nozaki began to look for work there and was more than happy to take a job offered to him by Paramount Studios. 
Things went well for the first few years. Then, in December 1941, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. A wave of anti-Japanese sentiment swept across America, especially along the Pacific coast. Feelings of hatred and distrust that became even more acute after the events of the Battle of Los Angeles. Because, despite the fact that in the following days there was a strong uncertainty about what had actually happened on the night of February the 24th, public opinion openly sided against the Japanese. The combined effects of the bombing of Elwood oil field and the Great Los Angeles air raid caused widespread fear among Southern Californians, leading to extreme, misguided and racist reactions. Letters began to arrive at the California governor's office, demanding the removal of Japanese Americans. Even the Speaker of the California Assembly, Gordon Garland, declared that these two events served to make us understand the danger of the continued presence of Japanese in American territory. At that point, President Roosevelt, who had apparently forgotten his own words, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, spoken just a decade earlier, issued Executive Order 9066, which authorized the military to define the entire West Coast as a military area and the permanent internment of more than 100,000 Japanese Americans. Although the order was issued a few days earlier, on February the 19th, the forced internment of Japanese Americans began in earnest in the spring of 1942 no doubt accelerated by public outrage over the Elwood attack and the Los Angeles air raid. Returning to Nozaki, for the mere fact of being Japanese, he found himself fully involved in all this and was fired from his job a few days after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Out of work, Nozaki began to earn a living as a night watchman for the fields of Japanese farmers who lived nearby. On the night of February the 24th, around 3 in the morning, after having drunk almost an entire thermos of hot coffee, Nozaki was walking in the field to shake off the cold and stretch his legs. He noticed that whereas there had previously been a faint glow of city lights on the horizon, mostly from Los Angeles a few miles to the west, it was now eerily dark. Nozaki had the feeling that something strange was happening and kept walking in the middle of the field to have a clearer and more unobstructed view. Then, silhouetted against the night sky, he saw a rather large, dark aerial object coming straight at him at a rather fast pace until he was right under the object, which passed over him for a few moments until it disappeared into the night sky as it gained height. 
It was huge, dark, very long and wide, with no lights or signs of windows. While it didn't have protruding wings like an airplane, the outer edges of the object curved ominously downward. Furthermore, other than feeling a slight vibration in his chest as it passed over him, the object made no sound. After the war, Nozaki was able to regain employment within the film industry as a set designer. Up until then, the alien spaceships featured in science fiction films of the time were quite similar to each other and were, trivially, modifications of V-2 rockets or flying saucer-like contraptions. Until, in 1953, the film War of the Worlds arrived. The film is considered by many insiders to be a cornerstone of the genre, a film that inspired science fiction films in the following years. The work won an Oscar for Best Visual Effects and, most likely, what gave the film so much success was Nozaki's work and his source of inspiration for the design of the film's spaceships. Nozaki explicitly said that he incorporated some of the menacing elements of the object he saw on the night of February the 24th to try to elicit in the viewer some of the fear he himself felt when the huge flying object approached overhead, as if it was about to grab him. Just as he wanted to recreate the way the object mysteriously remained in the air, apparently with some kind of technology or power that man did not possess. Therefore, considering that in 1983, more than 40 years after the events of the night of February the 24th, the History Office of the United States Air Force concluded that the alarm was caused by weather balloons, among other things, the same theory propounded also for the Roswell incident. Is it plausible that Albert Nozaki saw simple weather balloons that night and it was from them that he drew the inspiration for his terrifying flying machines in the War of the Worlds? The witness testimonies reported and analysed up to now are not only the most detailed, but also those most consistent with the true, demonstrable facts of what happened on the night of February the 24th, 1942. Furthermore, the eyewitnesses heard so far are all, or almost all, highly esteemed people, respected by the community, experts in their field of expertise, and above all, not prone to false sensationalism. What has been said acquires even greater strength and relevance if we compare the testimonies reported here with those immediately following the incident and reported in a local Los Angeles newspaper in its February 26th edition in an article entitled The Attack on Los Angeles. It reports confusion and disagreement. Some witnesses of the enemy attack on Los Angeles and environs early Wednesday saw at least two waves of bombers, 200 planes, flying over and dropping bombs. Other witnesses saw only one wave of planes and they couldn't be certain whether they were Japanese or American craft. 
Still others who watched the spectacle, if it can be called that, sighted no planes in the glare of the army searchlights. A number, however, reported seeing something that looked like a giant butterfly. It might have been a blimp, they said. At least one Reno resident received a telegram from a Los Angeles relative that bombs are dropping everywhere. One alleged witness saw at least one plane shot down by the anti-aircraft barrage. Most or all of these versions were carried yesterday morning in radio broadcasts. Some of the radio reports failed to explain that there was no official confirmation of an attack. They carried the numerous and varied conflicting reports of jittery Los Angeles citizens as if they were facts. The result, of course, was unnecessary panic. The radio broadcasters should be more discreet on such occasions. They should exercise the utmost care to impress upon their radio listeners the source of their reports. The broadcasters had a partial alibi on this occasion, however, given that the Secretary of War and the Secretary of the Navy still can't agree on the necessity for the Los Angeles alarm or what actually happened that night. Not only that, even in the testimony of the military station that night, there was a disconcerting confusion about what they actually saw in the sky above Los Angeles. In this regard, we will report the direct testimonies, collected from an internal investigation requested by Colonel Phillips, head of the Los Angeles Coast Anti-Aircraft Command Headquarters. An exhaustive investigation at the Brigade Headquarters, which lasted from noon to 5.15 p.m., uncovered some interesting but very conflicting testimonies. Some examples of these observations were as follows. Colonel Henry C. Davis, Executive Officer and Acting Commander of the 37th Brigade, believed for a moment that he saw 10 to 15 planes over Inglewood. But then immediately assumed that it was smoke drifting from the towers of the refinery not far from his position. Lieutenant Buchanan saw 20 to 30 planes over the city from the roof of his hotel at 8th and Flower. He estimated they were at 20,000 feet and flying at 150 miles per hour. Three guards who were with him at the time saw them in the spotlight and could hear their engines, but could not see them clearly. Several soldiers testified to the presence of about seven to eight planes, which they saw flying very high, and which looked like birds when they ended up in the beams of the searchlights. Colonel Watson of the 203rd California Regiment saw a weather balloon at 3 a.m. He immediately called the meteorological laboratory and discovered that they had in fact recently sent up a weather balloon and therefore ordered the units of his command not to fire. He didn't see any planes. Also at 3 a.m., Captain Mulder, another member of the 203rd California Army Regiment, saw an object that looked like a weather balloon reflected in the lights and, despite this, began shooting at it at an altitude between 0 and 9,000 feet. Captain Cohen of the 214th Regiment also identified the object as a weather balloon when illuminated by searchlights. However, none of the SCR-268 radars in operation detected it, 
despite assiduous searching. Captain Bailey of the 214th CA searched with his SCR 268 at the crossing of the searchlights, but got no results. Sergeant Bowman, also of the 214th Regiment, at 3.10 a.m., saw five aircraft with the naked eye from 310 San Diego Street. They look like bombers at 30,000 feet, flying in a wedge and then a T formation. Lieutenant Niles, stationed southeast of Los Angeles with his binoculars, saw a V drawn in the sky by the flight trails of three planes flying at 9,000 feet along two different flight paths. Lieutenant Head of the 122nd Regiment also saw a V formation from the wake of three aircraft at 9,000 feet, but his SCR-268 radar systems picked up nothing. Lieutenant Anderson of the 78th Regiment at the Douglas plant in Long Beach saw an aircraft through his scope at 3.25 a.m. and his elevation finder read 6,725 yards. A few minutes later, he saw three planes through his binoculars flying at the same height. Lieutenant Ben Dixon of the 122nd Regiment and two of his men counted 14 planes flying slowly at a high altitude. Private Gaylor of Battery B of the 122nd Regiment also saw a V formation, however caused by the flight of five aircraft, and he and the entire battery were ordered to shoot at them. Captain Hyde of the 3rd Regiment, Port Defences, at 4.15 a.m. even saw two groups of six aircraft each. As one can imagine, from the testimonies just reported, only confusion and total discord emerge, even among the members of the army directly involved in the battle, belonging to different regiments or even the same regiment. Therefore, one wonders, do these testimonies really report what the military observed that night? Or was the investigation designed to confuse the entire US population, thus contributing to a distorted narrative of what actually happened on the night of February the 24th, 1942? In fact, regarding this, and again quoting the set published in 1983 by the press office of the United States government entitled The Army Air Forces in World War II. We can read how attempts to arrive at an explanation of the event soon became as twisted and mysterious as the battle itself. The Navy immediately insisted that there was no evidence of enemy aircraft, and Secretary Knox announced in a February 25th press conference that the raid was a false alarm. In the same conference, however, he admitted that attacks were always possible and indicated that vital industries located along the coast should be moved inland. Still, the Army had trouble deciding the cause of the alert and, refuting the Navy's report, issued their own report that indicated one to five unidentified planes flew over Los Angeles that night. Secretary Stimson heralded this conclusion as the War Department version and put forward two theories to explain the mysterious aircraft. Either they were commercial aircraft manned by an enemy from secret camps in California or Mexico, or they were Japanese submarine-launched light aircraft. In both cases, according to the Army, the enemy's aim must have been to locate anti-aircraft defenses in the area, or to strike a blow to civilian morale.
This difference of opinion between the War and Navy departments and the Army's unsatisfactory conjectures to explain the story sparked vigorous public discussion. A scathing op-ed published in the Washington Post on February the 27th called the handling of the Los Angeles episode a recipe for public ill humor. It lambasted the military authorities for what it called a stubborn silence in the face of widespread demand to understand what had actually happened on the night of February the 24th. The op-ed also suggested that the Army's theory that commercial aircraft triggered the alert explains everything, except where the planes came from, where they were going, and why no American planes were sent to pursue them. The New York Times, in an article dated February the 28th, pointed out that the more the incident was studied and analyzed in detail, the more incredible it became bordering on the absurd. If the batteries were firing at nothing, as Secretary Knox implies, this would have meant that the army was guilty of gross and also very costly incompetence. Whereas, if the anti-aircraft batteries were actually firing at real enemy aircraft, as Secretary Stimson states, why were these shots completely ineffective why didn't any American planes take off to engage them or even identify them? Furthermore, at the end of the war, the Japanese declared they had not sent aircraft to the California area at the time of the alarm. These doubts were, and continue to be, appropriate. But for the War Department to answer in full frankness, would likely have resulted in a shocking revelation about who or what really crossed the sky above Los Angeles that night. A revelation that perhaps, according to the US government, the Americans and people of the world were not yet ready to hear. In this regard, in conclusion to the first part of this documentary that relates to the events in Los Angeles that took place on the night of February the 24th, 1942, we must report the testimony, albeit not direct, of the well-known professor, astronomer and meteorite hunter, Dr. Lincoln La Paz, who had a history of thousands and thousands of hours of scientific observation of celestial objects. During World War II, while on leave from Ohio State, Professor La Paz served as a research mathematician at the New Mexico Proving Grounds and as technical director of the Military Operations Analysis Section for the Second Air Force. The astronomer was not there the night in which the Battle of Los Angeles took place, but he was very fascinated by the stories of the witnesses of that night especially in reference to the size of the object, considering that most of the UFO sighting phenomena up to that moment referred to small objects, more similar to flying saucers rather than airships. Furthermore, given his knowledge in the military environment, he learned from reliable sources that the object had actually sunk off the coast of San Diego at dawn on February the 25th, 1942, just off the island of San Clemente. Yet, some time later, he himself denied this theory because, thanks to the brilliant services he offered during the Second World War, he was able to access top secret classified documents. One of these was about a covert United States Navy deep sea recovery operation of an apparently unknown object that landed off San Clemente Island in a deep sea trench about 78 miles west of San Diego and 63 miles south of Long Beach on the night of February the 24th, 1942. Does this date remind you of anything?
On the night of February the 24th, 1942, the inhabitants of the city of Los Angeles and its surroundings were awakened with a start by the deafening sound of air raid sirens. A general blackout, called by the military stationed in the area, in addition to the darkness of the night, contributed to growing fear in the population, now sure of being close to an enemy attack. Yet, despite the fact that the US military fired over 1,400 shots into the sky over Los Angeles, there was no attack. What probably happened that February night in the Los Angeles area was the visit of an extraterrestrial civilization. Dr. Richard Boylan is a world-renowned psychologist, anthropologist and UFO and extraterrestrial researcher and consultant. He specializes in counseling star kids and star seeds adults, seeking to better understand their full origin and identity, their star heritage and their mission on Earth. So they can achieve inner growth, greater spiritual development and a more complete understanding of how they will fit into humanity's evolving future. Dr. Boylan wrote an article published in Nexus magazine entitled Inside Revelations on the UFO Cover-Up in which he quotes the words of Dr. Michael Wolf, author of the book Catchers of Heaven and member and advisor to a secret National Security Council special study group known as Operation Majestic 12 which oversees extraterrestrial type affairs in the United States. The article explains that Dr. Wolf, in his work, has provided a revisionist story about the beginning of the modern UFO era, stating that in 1941, the first UFO crashed into the ocean west of San Diego and was recovered by the Navy. Therefore, Dr. Wolf argues the Navy has maintained a leadership position on UFO matters ever since. Interestingly, in response to this Nexus article, Dr. Boylan received a letter from the now deceased son of Colonel William Brophy. In the letter, Brophy's son reports that his father told him on more than one occasion that the discovery of the first UFO had not occurred in 1941, as stated by Dr. Wolf and sources close to him. But in fact the following year, on the more specific date of February the 25th, 1942. Does that date ring any bells? Dr. Boylan clarifies, however, that there is no confirmation for this date other than the details provided by Colonel Brophy through his son's words. Yet, the event itself, that is, the recovery of a UFO by the Navy off the coast of San Diego, certainly took place, as written in a note of exceptional content dated March the 5th, 1942, sent by the Army Chief of Staff to the President of the United States, which we will speak about shortly. Taking note of this, it is much more probable that a note dated March the 5th, considering the timing and its contents, refers to an event that occurred not long before, rather than something that happened even a year earlier, i.e. in 1941, as stated by Dr. Wolf. Naturally, these are conjectures, and we will leave the viewer the right to consider these conjectures plausible or more simply worthy of attention. That said, the date mentioned by Colonel Brophy's son is, 
of course, entirely consistent with our thesis. As February the 25th, 1942, is the exact same date that a mysterious flying object was seen by hundreds, if not thousands of people, crossing the city of Los Angeles from Palos Verdes in the west to Signal Hill in the east, before heading south along the California coast and then disappearing, continuing its trajectory in the San Diego area. If you recall, when the aircraft flew over the house of the famous blogger The Wonderling, the object was so low that his father thought it was about to land. Now, since no one seems to know what happened to the object, there is a real possibility that it actually crashed in the Pacific, somewhere off San Diego, and was later recovered by the Navy. Naturally, a recovery of this type would have involved a maximum level of secrecy for all those involved. Not only commanders and officers, but also non-commissioned officers, cooks and simple sailors. In short, all those who would have worked in oceanic, and therefore very deep, waters on the recovery of an object that was said to be much larger than an airship. Still, it is fair to say that in the years that followed, no one among members of the Navy ever mentioned such an operation. Therefore, either the people involved managed to keep an event of this magnitude a secret for so many years, or this recovery never happened. But is this really the case? There is another theory about what happened to the object once it disappeared from radar and from the view of the inhabitants of the city of Los Angeles. All beach towns south of Santa Monica and Redondo Beach reported seeing the object. None of the beach resorts from Long Beach and further south reported the same. Thus, it is assumed that some distance off the coast west of Seal Beach or Sunset Beach, or possibly Huntington Beach as well, the object veered southwest and headed for San Clemente Island, which at the time was uninhabited. Moving down the coast from the north, San Clemente is the last and southernmost of the Channel Islands, located less than 50 miles off the California coast and about halfway between Long Beach and San Diego. The aircraft could have landed to assess any damage received or make some sort of repairs and then could have taken off before anyone could intervene. In February 1942, there was a barely used, if not virtually abandoned, Navy Auxiliary Air Station located right in the centre of the island. By 1938, the Works Progress Administration, or WPA, and an outside contractor had constructed two airstrips, one 2,000 feet and the other 3,000 feet long. The construction was completed in 1941, but was never used. It's not that the object needed a runway to land, but more likely an open and unobstructed area. Away from the population, from the weapons of the military, and from the gaze of the most curious. San Clemente Island was the only area where it would have been practicable to land a vessel hit or damaged in any way within a radius of thousands of miles. There were no anti-aircraft guns, no armed ground batteries, no searchlights, no prying eyes. It was only after the incident that any military presence appeared on the island. 
First, with a Marine Scout squadron suddenly starting operations on the spot with 19 Vought SB2U Vindicator aircraft in 1942, then with the Army installing and activating two fully equipped radar stations. In other words, by the time the object exited the Pacific south of Long Beach, heading towards the general direction of San Diego, the island was virtually uninhabited. We will probably never know if the object actually managed to escape and maybe return to the place from which it came, or if a part of it lies rotting at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, or if it was captured together with its crew by the United States Navy on San Clemente Island. What we know for sure, however, is that only two days after the sighting of the object, on February the 27th, 1942, handwritten communication reached the desk of the then President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The communication was from General George C. Marshall, US Army Chief of Staff throughout World War II, and one of the first people involved in the atomic bombing of Japan. The note, with extraordinary content and absolutely top secret, reads as follows. I have considered the disposition of the material in possession of the Army that may be of great significance toward the development of a super weapon of war. I disagree with the argument that such information should be shared with our ally, the Soviet Union. Consultation with Dr. Bush and other scientists on the issue of finding practical uses for the atomic secrets learned from study of celestial devices precludes any further discussion and I therefore authorize Dr. Bush to proceed with the project without further delay. This information is vital to the nation's superiority and must remain within the confines of state secrets. Any further discussions on the matter will be restricted to General Donovan, Dr. Bush, the Secretary of War and yourself. The challenge our nation faces is daunting and perilous in this undertaking, and I have committed the resources of the government towards that end. You have my assurance that when circumstances are favourable and we are victorious, the Army will have the fruits of research in exploring further applications of this new wonder. We repeat, this is an official note sent by General Marshall, Chief of Staff of the US Army, to then US President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. A note classified top secret and declassified only a few years ago. It is very interesting to note how General Marshall explicitly speaks of atomic secrets learned from the study of celestial devices and does so only two days after the Los Angeles incident, with the flying object mysteriously disappearing. Could this be the same object seen on the night of February the 24th by the witnesses we have heard from so far? Of course, it is fair to ask whether in such a short period of time, just two days, it is possible for a human being, even with high scientific and military skills, to learn something from an object built by an extraterrestrial life form, with technologies and knowledge much more advanced and extensive than ours. However, it is also important to point out 
that the content of the note is not sensationalist, and indeed, from it we can perceive a certain receptive atmosphere towards UFO phenomena. Incidentally, the Dr. Bush referred to in the memo is Dr. Vannevar Bush, Chairman of the National Defense Resource Committee, leading figure in the Atomic Weapons Invention and Development Program for the war effort. Before the outbreak of World War II, with the potential threat of hostilities between the United States and Japan appearing ever closer to reality, Roosevelt promoted the Chief of the Office of Naval Intelligence, Captain Walter C. Anderson, who had personally done extensive top-secret work cracking the Japanese code, to new commander of the battleships of the Pacific Fleet. As we anticipated, on March 5, 1942, less than two weeks after the aforementioned message, Marshall sent another top-secret memo to President Roosevelt regarding the air raid on Los Angeles. The content of this note is perhaps even more explicit and surprising than the previous one. For the sake of accuracy of information, and as we have just done, we will report the full content of the note. Unfortunately, as you can see, the conditions of the sheet are not optimal, and therefore some words are missing. However, the gist of the speech is clear and irrefutable. As indicated in my February 25th memorandum to you regarding the air raid over Los Angeles, it has been learned by Army G2 that Rear Admiral Anderson, through the Office of Naval Intelligence, has informed the War Department of a naval recovery of an unidentified airplane off the coast of California, unlike no bearing on conventional explanation. Further investigation has revealed that the Army Air Corps also recovered a similar aircraft in the San Bernardino Mountains east of Los Angeles, which cannot be certified as conventional aircraft. Thus, headquarters has come to the determination that the mystery airplanes are in fact not earthly, and according to secret intelligence sources, they are in all probability of interplanetary origin. As a consequence, I have issued orders to Army G2 that a special intelligence unit be created to further investigate the phenomenon and report any significant connection between recent incidents and those collected by the Director of the Office of Coordinator of Information. I have further ordered a thorough investigation of all War Department files regarding unconventional aerial phenomenon reported since 1897 and what extent on the subject. At present, GHQ has no further information which would invalidate this conclusion. Pending any further investigation into the matter shall be limited to those authorized by you. Is there a clearer and more explicit confirmation than this? We reiterate, this is not a note written by a lonely and desperate paranoid elderly housewife as much as an official note, classified top secret, written and sent by the Chief of Staff, General Marshall, to the then President of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt. Marshall refers to his previous note by elaborating on what he had only superficially mentioned. He 
He speaks of a naval recovery of an unidentified airplane off the California coast, where the mysterious flying object appeared to have disappeared on the night of February the 24th, which cannot be certified as a conventional aircraft. Most likely, between February the 25th, the date of the discovery, and March the 5th, the date of the note just mentioned, Marshall learned further information from the study of the aircraft which he had already mentioned, among other things, in the note dated February the 27th. Furthermore, Marshall does not mince words or beat around the bush, and instead speaks clearly, limpidly, of planes most likely of interplanetary origin. Note that the general speaks of planes, using the plural. Yet, we have analyzed the words of the Los Angeles witnesses of the events of that night, and all agree that they saw only one object of enormous dimensions. It could be that the lead vessel, in an attempt to reduce its weight, dropped a kind of safety ship or lifeboat or two, either on the island or in the Pacific, and that it was these that were located, recovered and then studied by the military. Finally, from the note, we can learn how General Marshall speaks of the Army, referring to the military unit that dealt with the recovery, and not the Navy. Undoubtedly, the Navy was involved because it was a recovery in aquatic territory. But, given that we are talking about a recovery of flying objects, these were certainly the responsibility of the Air Force. However, it is important to note that in 1942, the Air Force was not a separate entity, but operated under the control of the Army. So, flying objects were the military's purview, and that's no doubt how non-Navy Air Force Colonel William Brophy learned of the information which he then shared with his son and which eventually reached Dr. Boylan. It all makes sense. If you remember, we spoke about the absence of testimonies among the members of the Navy regarding the possible recovery of the object off the coast of San Clemente Island, and we had closed with a question, but is that really the case? As mentioned, no one, apart from Colonel Brophy's son, made any mention of such an operation. Then, in reality, we have seen how even General Marshall in an informative note to President Roosevelt, confirms an operation to recover and study extraterrestrial aircraft. But none of these were part of the Navy Military Corps. Still, it is unlikely that the Navy would not be involved in an operation off the ocean coast. So, did the operation never take place? Or are Navy soldiers better able to keep a secret than Army and Air Force soldiers? To answer this question, we rely once again on the testimony of the well-known blogger, The Wonderling. After finishing high school, the blogger owned an immaculately restored 1940 wooden Ford station wagon. One spring morning, on a fine day, he drove out in his Ford to one of his favourite restaurants in the South Bay for breakfast. Shortly thereafter, a man came in, yelling at the top of his lungs and asking if anyone in the restaurant owned the wooden station wagon out front. Concerned that this man or someone else had crashed into it, destroying it, the blogger ran out of the restaurant and realised that the car was in perfect condition, just as he'd left it. The man yelling was the skipper of a yacht moored in Marina del Rey harbour. He just wanted to know who owned the classic car 
and who was responsible for maintaining the wood. Breathing a huge sigh of relief that the car hadn't been demolished beyond repair, the Wanderling replied that the person responsible for keeping the wood in top repair was himself. The skipper then asked if he would be interested in working on the wood finishing of his boat, that is, in practice, sanding, scraping and varnishing all the wood present in the boat. The blogger, before accepting, out of curiosity, went to the pier where the boat was moored to have a look at it. The day he was there, a young woman was walking along the dock with several small children in tow, when one of them, a very small girl who probably couldn't swim, lost her footing and slipped into the water. The little girl was about to drown and her mother started screaming like crazy. Since he was the person closest to the position where the girl was, the Wonderling dived into the water, reaching the child and bringing her back safely into the arms of her mother. Meanwhile, a small crowd had gathered on the dock and everyone complimented the man on his courage and promptness. Among them was a woman, Sullivan, a former swimsuit model for Rosemarie Reed. The woman owned a boat moored there in the harbour and asked the blogger if he would like to have a drink with her on her yacht, put on some dry clothes and get his breath back. The man accepted, they stayed together for a few hours and then the woman asked him if he would be willing to participate in the party she had organised for that evening. The blogger accepted and at the appointed time and place showed up at the party. Unexpectedly, two things related to the Los Angeles UFO incident came up during the party, both from the same person, a diver named Jack, a respected marine archaeologist well known along the California coast for his diving expertise and underwater archaeology. The two started talking, and between one thing and another, the conversation turned to the subject of the Battle of Los Angeles. The archaeologist said that, although he hadn't been born yet at the time of the events, he had met a couple of men, former Navy soldiers, who had participated in a diving operation linked to the recovery of the object. They told him it was an operation of a highly secretive nature off San Clemente Island a few months into the war, not between the coast and the island proper, but on the southwest side in the open ocean. They told Jack that, as far as they knew, nothing came of it and nothing of note was found or located. Furthermore, the dives had been carried out during the day, as was normal, in collaboration with the Navy's ARS-1 Viking rescue vessel, under a civilian contract. However, the normal day teams, including the two of them, were withdrawn and sent back, while a so-called special team of night divers was brought into the deep V-shaped open trench directly off the southwestern tip of San Clemente Island. It is not known what, or if, these night divers found anything. Second, Jack said that even though San Clemente Island was now managed and controlled by the Navy, and was therefore off-limits territory, he could take the blogger to the island. Naturally, the Wanderling accepted, and was thus able to visit the island, examine the place, and understand that it was actually an ideal place to land, or in any case stop, 
away from the prying eyes of the Californian coast. Not only that, during the conversation between the blogger and the archaeologist, a man approached the two, hearing them talk about the events of Los Angeles, saying that he too had something to say about it. His name was Bob Drake, and he was a US Navy diver, very well known and respected in Southern California during the early 1960s because he used to participate in sports car races. Drake had had an instructor at his military academy who was one of the most important divers in the Navy, especially in night dives in the open sea and at great depths. Drake informed them that the instructor gave up teaching to participate in and lead a top secret nighttime deep sea salvage operation off the coast of Southern California. The man asked Drake, given his strong innate diving skills, his temperament and his physical size, to be part of the team. Apparently, the upper management agreed because Drake, under the obligation of secrecy, ended up being a member of that recovery team, diving off San Clemente Island in search of the unknown aerial object said to have crashed in the deep sea trench west of the island. Drake said he barely got close to the object, but he clearly saw that something was there and that it was definitely not a submarine or ship or land-based aircraft. Finally, he said that after that operation, he was never called to another recovery mission of that level and that he never knew anything about the object or any other information related to that operation. As you can see, even the wall of silence erected by the Navy soldiers collapsed with relative simplicity. Now, in the last part of our work on the events in Los Angeles that took place between February the 24th and February the 25th, 1942, we will focus on the analysis of the military installations along the California coast and the shots fired against the no longer so mysterious flying object. We said that, for reasons apparently unknown to us, the object, after passing south of the Edison power plant at Redondo, instead of continuing south, around or beyond the Palos Verdes Peninsula, veered diagonally inward towards south-southeast. We use the expression, for unknown reasons, because we do not know why the object's direction changed. So, the question remains, why did the object suddenly decide to change course? How did it know that if it continued along the coast in the same direction, it would have met even more resistance and hostility than it had already faced? Let's try to provide an answer. People have a tendency to think that the AA, or anti-aircraft defences, deployed around the Los Angeles area in February 1942 were adequate or good, when in fact they weren't at all. In fact, in December 1941, only 60 days before the Los Angeles event, there were only 12 guns available to protect all defence installations in the area as documented in the book, The Army Air Forces in World War II, Volume 6. The anti-aircraft units, trained and administered by the Coast Artillery, 
but assigned to the interceptor commands for operational control in 1941 were too few and their equipment too scarce. There were so many vital installations in relation to available AA strength that dispositions had to be based on a system of priorities, which meant in reality that responsible officers did the best they could to guess where attacks were most likely to be made. Typical of the gulf between needs and resources was the situation in Southern California. The first plans of 1941 were so ambitious as to be dubbed, later, the Santa Claus Plans. By late August 1941, a moderate schedule to cover immediate emergencies had been framed. This minimum plan called for 123-inch guns for Los Angeles and its immediate environs but in December there were only 12 guns on hand to protect all the defence plants of that area. For San Diego, the army had no mobile AA strength at all to assign. The planners related later that they had done everything they could for San Diego. They had prayed that no attack would come. It was the anti-aircraft guns of the 4th Anti-Aircraft Command that opened fire on the gigantic, unidentified aerial object on the night of the 24th of February, 1942. The units involved were the 37th Coastal Anti-Aircraft Artillery Brigade, the 65th Coast Artillery Regiment, based at Inglewood, and the 205th Coast Artillery Regiment, based in Santa Monica. The armament of these regiments at the time consisted of 3-inch and 37mm anti-aircraft guns and it was a combination of these guns and those in the surrounding batteries that detonated the nearly 10 tons of munitions that rained down on Los Angeles and surrounding cities during the alleged night raid. We will report all the numbers of shots fired shortly. At higher altitudes, the 3-inch guns and 1.5-inch shells from the 37mm guns made no visible impact. As the object veered south along El Segundo and toward Redondo Beach, it lowered its altitude until it was parallel to the beach, just above the ocean. Then, just after passing the Edison plant, it veered sharply diagonally inland heading southeast, passing over the Happy Hour Café owned by the infamous Fifi Malouf. This sudden diagonal inward turn, just past the Edison plant, was most likely a move planned and made due to what was on the Redondo Beach Pier. Two 155mm anti-aircraft guns were installed at the end of the pier. It wasn't dealing with 3-inch or 37mm cannons, but of enormous beasts that fired projectiles of 15cm in diameter. It appears that the object was able to withstand anti-aircraft shells without problems, but 155mm shells at such close range, fired from both guns in tandem, would perhaps have been much more effective and would have done serious damage to the object. The aircraft then decided to turn inland towards the low coastal hills. The guns on the Redondo Beach Pier were unable to rotate 360 degrees, and even if they had been able to, they could not have aimed their muzzles at the object, because it was no longer visible, covered as it was 
by the hills. The same was true when the object turned south along El Segundo and headed towards Redondo Beach, lowering its altitude. The reason it decided to fly at such a low altitude is that between El Segundo and Redondo Beach, in the city of Manhattan Beach, were two of the most fearsome weapons it would encounter in its path, perhaps even more so than the two 155mm cannons on the Redondo Beach Pier. In downtown Manhattan Beach, just a few blocks away from the ocean, were two huge 8-inch railroad guns, mounted on purpose-built flat cars and positioned on a siding built specifically for gun emplacement. By February 1942, both guns were in perfect working condition and already parked on a siding at Manhattan Beach, along what is now Ardmore near 14th Street. The cannons could easily fire their 500-pound shells up to a distance of 20 miles and, unlike Redondo's cannons, were capable of 360-degree rotation. However, they were unable to fire at an object so close, just above the beach, because if they did, it would have pulverized and wiped out everything in the vicinity. Now, as mentioned earlier, let's review the total number and type of bullets fired against the object on the night of February the 24th, 1942, over the sky of Los Angeles. The source of the following data regarding the number of anti-aircraft shells fired and their size was compiled from research data provided by the History of the 4th AA Command, Western Defence Command, the 9th of January 1942 to the 1st of July 1945. Approximately 1,400 rounds of 3-inch anti-aircraft ammunition were fired at an unspecified variety of targets in the Los Angeles area. Time, 3.06 a.m. Batteries B, C and D of the 65th and battery B of the 205th. 482 3-inch rounds. Time, 3.33 a.m. Batteries B, C, D, G and H of the 78th and B, C and D of the 122nd, 581 3-inch rounds, 38 37mm rounds. Time, 3.55 a.m. Batteries C and D of the 65th, 100 3-inch rounds. Time, 4.05 a.m. Batteries B, C and D of the 78th, 246 3-inch rounds. Total number of rounds, 1,447. The armament of the regiments involved at the time consisted of 3-inch and 37mm anti-aircraft guns and it was a combination of these guns and those in the surrounding batteries that expended the nearly 10 tonnes of ammunition that rained down of all of Los Angeles and the surrounding cities during the alleged air raid. Also, the figures do not reflect the additional or unaccounted for ammunition which could easily exceed the nearly 10 tonnes of ammunition quoted.
for some reason, the Hollywood Riviera anti-aircraft battery is not included in any of the statistics. It is very likely that it was not in full operation or even on an active operational list, with the crew still in a state of training. It's probable that they just joined in, completely off the cuff. As noted, it was only in daylight that American military units made the shocking discovery that there had been no enemy attack. Although reports have been mixed and efforts are being made to establish the facts, it is clear that no bombs have dropped or aircraft shot down, the US Army's Western Defense Command said in a statement. Ironically, the only damage during the Battle of Los Angeles was from friendly fire. Shrapnel from the anti-aircraft defense rained down on the city, shattering windows and ripping apart buildings. Shrapnel landed on a Long Beach golf course and several residents saw their homes partially destroyed by the three-inch artillery shells we mentioned. While there were no serious injuries from the shooting, at least five people were reported to have died during that night's tragic events. Two men, George P. Vail, an air raid warden, and Henry B. Ayers, a California State Guard driver, died of heart attacks during the blackout. Unfortunately, three other people died in road accidents due to the blackout caused by the military authorities in the area. Zeula Klein of Arcadia was killed while her husband was driving during the blackout with his headlights off and collided with a milk truck. In Long Beach, Police Sergeant Engelbert Larson was killed in a head-on collision while reporting for 911 duty. Finally, a pedestrian, Jesus Alferez, was hit by a vehicle and later died of his injuries. However, despite these tragedies, there was also joy. Several children were born during the Los Angeles air raid, including a robust 12-pound boy, William Dallas Nicholas. The Los Angeles Times wrote in amazement about the newborn baby. Young Nicholas was apparently born under the glare of electric torches, as was revealed yesterday. Put out the lights, please, shouted an air raid warden as he hurried down the street, worried that the glow in the dark of night and in the darkness caused by the blackout could be noticed by enemies. However, without being discouraged, the assistance of Dr. Bray, a surgeon working as an obstetrician exceptionally for that night, found several torches in Nicholas's house and the delivery thus went without complications. We are at the end of our documentary on the events in Los Angeles between February the 24th and 25th, 1942. We have reconstructed the facts by analysing them in detail, reporting real testimonies, official documents, images and historical artefacts. In 1983, the United States Air Force History Office concluded that the initial alarm was caused by weather balloons. Supporting this explanation would be an article in which Los Angeles reporter and war veteran Matt Weinstock interviews a man who claims to have served on the night of February the 24th, 1942 in one of the anti-aircraft batteries operating in the area affected by the conflict.
At the start of the war, things were pretty scary and the army was setting up coastal defences. At one of the new radar stations, near Santa Monica, the crew tried unsuccessfully to pass some aircraft to test the system. Since no one could spare the planes at the time, they came up with a new way to test the radar. One of the guys bought a bag of nickel balloons and then filled them with hydrogen, attached some wires and let them go. By catching the sea breeze, the balloons had the desired effect of appearing on screens, proving that the equipment worked. But after travelling a good distance offshore and to the south, the night breeze onshore began to push the balloons back towards the coastal towns. The coastal radar picked up the metal wires and the searchlights automatically focused on the targets, watching the balloons heading towards the city on the screens. The ak ak started firing and the rest is history. As it happens, the theory of weather balloons is the same and identical conclusion to which the US authorities came to to justify the Roswell incident which occurred five years after the events in Los Angeles. Yet, we have seen that there are sufficient elements to support the theory that it was not a Japanese air raid, let alone a weather balloon or even a ghost ship. Most likely, on the night of February the 24th, 1942, in the sky over the city of Los Angeles, what we can define as an extraterrestrial civilization visited our planet aboard an alien spaceship larger than a Zeppelin airship. Unfortunately, due to the terrible attack on the Pearl Harbor base that took place only a few months earlier, the US response to that visit was very, very violent albeit ineffective. Today, 80 years after the incident, would human civilization be more inclined to welcome an extraterrestrial civilization We don't know how to answer this question. However, we can definitely state that the population of Los Angeles managed to derive a source of entertainment from the events of that night of February the 24th, 1942. In fact, every February, the Fort MacArthur Museum, located at the entrance to the port of Los Angeles, hosts an event called the Great LA Air Raid of 1942, where they attempt to recreate the facts and atmosphere of the Battle of Los Angeles. The event, billed as an exciting recreation of a historic controversy, occupies part of the former military installation to recreate the atmosphere of a 1942 social soiree, interrupted by the reality of war. Men in uniforms of LAPD officers and military personnel with vintage clothing and vehicles greet guests as they arrive. Inside, several jeeps, military trucks and tanks are on display, as well as a few 1940s classic cars. In the afternoon, two World War II fighter planes perform an air show above the fort, while the presenter introduces the musical band. Guests are then invited to take a tour of the park, to visit the interior of the museum and to grab a tray of food from the cafeteria. Throughout the event, guests can dance to the hottest tunes of the era, such as Bier mir bist du schön and In the Mood, played by the Fort MacArthur Officers Orchestra. 
Periodically, the music is interrupted by the announcement of a green alert due to aircraft spotted off the coast. Thus, in a short time, when the sunlight has already given way to the dark of the evening, large searchlights are pointed into the sky and the reenactment of the actual battle is staged, with cannons and fireworks being fired from the top of the fort. Not only that, on June the 14th, 2011, the film Battle Los Angeles was released, an action film directed by Jonathan Liebsman whose plot is freely inspired by the events of the Battle of Los Angeles narrated so far. The film follows a platoon of US Marines fighting to defend Los Angeles from an alien invasion. In the film, the clash between the military and an extraterrestrial civilization is clear and well known to all, military, government and civilians included. The truth about the Battle of Los Angeles of February 1942, the one that actually happened, will probably never come to light. Due to a very probable, almost certain, cover-up of the whole affair by the governments that have taken office over the years in Washington. Is it actually possible that a weather balloon could withstand more than a thousand shots fired by US military artillery? Who would actually bet on the truth of this weather balloon thesis? Scott Littleton, eyewitness of the events of that night, internationally renowned ufologist, has spent his life trying to discover the truth about the Battle of Los Angeles and other historical events related to probable extraterrestrial invasion, which we mentioned in the first part of our documentary. He draws his conclusions of the whole story by simply analysing the data and testimonies collected and summarising them in seven main elements, or, as he defines them, irrefutable pieces of evidence. The object flew following precise, controlled and we can say intelligent flight paths. Its absolute invulnerability to gunfire and anti-aircraft guns. Its enormous size, more than 800 feet in diameter, much larger than an airship. Its brilliant white, and according to some reports, even orange, glow, which was much more evident when illuminated by the beams of anti-aircraft searchlights. Its oval conformation, with a protuberance on the dorsal side and the other characteristics that we have described in detail, which made it an object undoubtedly unique in its kind and unlike any aircraft known and designed by human beings. The likely EMF impact on pursuit aircraft flying too close to the object. The absence of any post-war Japanese documentation showing the presence of one of their aircraft over Los Angeles that night of February the 24th, 1942. Littleton believes, therefore, that the most plausible explanation for the object that triggered the so-called Battle of Los Angeles that night is that it was a real, unidentified flying object from beyond our planet. Littleton concludes by saying that he is convinced that the episode he witnessed that night, 80 years ago, when he was only 8 years old, was a clear sighting of an unidentified flying object or a UFO. Not only that, he also strongly states that the Los Angeles sighting must be counted among the most important episodes in the history of this extraordinary phenomenon. In short, will we ever know the truth behind the Battle of Los Angeles or, more generally, about the UFO phenomenon? In this regard, in recent years, the US government seems more inclined to provide more details and information regarding this phenomenon, now called with a new acronym, namely UAP, 
unidentified aerial phenomenon. In fact, a recent Pentagon report would reveal a significant increase in reports of such phenomena made by military and members of the US Navy and Air Force, reaching 350, half of which have remained unexplained so far. The report was released by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence in collaboration with the US Department of Defense's All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. The security of our service personnel, our bases and US operations on land, in the air, at sea and in space is paramount. Stated Pentagon Press Secretary General Pat Ryder expressing concern about national security. We take reports of incursions into our designated space, land, sea or airspace seriously and investigate each one. However, only the confidential version of the report, the unclassified version, provides more details on the reports that remained unsolved or unexplained. Despite this, we expect that in the following years, the US government, and more generally, the governments of the whole world, will show themselves more inclined to study the UFO phenomenon, or if you prefer it, the UAP phenomenon, in a serious and in-depth manner, and that they will above all be more willing to share information and discoveries about it. We conclude this documentary on the Battle of Los Angeles by reporting a recent statement by Bill Nelson, Administrator of NASA. Who am I to say that planet Earth is the only place where there is a form of civilized and organized life like ours? <laughs>